So hi, I'm Patricia Shaw. I'm from England. Um, I'm 20 years as an IT and data lawyer. Um, I've, for the last 13 years, I have been working for a, a global data company. And um, since January, I've stepped out because I believe there are real potential issues for Christians in the ethics space of this new AI and machine learning and believe that we need to um, rise up to the, the task of and challenge of this. So I'm here as Trish Shaw from Beyond Reach and looking forward to speaking with my colleagues here today. And Bruce, if you uh, would introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm Bruce Little. I've been uh, philosophy. I've been teaching philosophy for 20 some years, uh, well more than that, I say now, time passes quite quickly. Um, and so my concern is from a philosophical slash apologetic view, but probably more from the philosophical side of things. Um, and uh, I've been involved here in doing mentoring. What I do is uh, do a lot of lectures here in Eastern Europe uh, to, at national universities. I'm invited uh, to come in and to speak, just was in Romania, speaking in a couple of universities on this particular subject, uh, and quite uh, amazed at the kind of questions that are coming forth, even out of the secular world, um, about this, this matter, so. From my perspective, the AI, uh, in AI field, uh, very helpful for human perspective, uh, will be doing work uh, at very hard conditions that, that normally human they are doing, and maybe robots uh, with some rudiments of, let's say, machine learning or, or even AI or elements of AI uh, could do. I mean, the, the minery, uh, I mean, um, very hard conditions of, of driving cars in, let's say, uh, on, on very high, um, very high roads, right, uh, in, in this area of, of, uh, of the world. Uh, so, in short, um, this should be very helpful using uh, Jeremy's perspective uh, that AI will be uh, the, the tools, the AI robots will be the tools in, in human hands uh, to help people uh, in very hard condition of work. That's more general from my perspective. Okay, thank you. If you could pass it on. Uh, <laughs> I may be a little more pessimistic <laughs> about this, not from what it may do for us, because I'm sure it will, but my deep concern is what is it doing to us as human beings? So while I do think there are some really uh, positive things that it could do for us, uh, I am with uh, Richard, uh, uh, Stephen Hawking, who back uh, two years ago at a, at a conference said that AI may be the most wonderful thing that has been uh, created uh, by uh, humans, but then he said it may be the very worst thing if we do not learn how to uh, control it and have proper guidelines for it. So on the one hand, yes, there are some pro undoubtedly good things in doing pretty much what you're talking about, doing some of those tasks that it can do better, but the, the deep concern is, as I say, not what is it doing for us, now, that's a question we can answer quite quickly, but what is it doing to us, which is my deep concern. So I have a little uh, optimism, and then I have a lot of uh, pessimism about it, I suppose. I think there are a lot, of, a lot of challenges with AI, a lot of serious questions that we need to address about, about where we go with the technology, how we use it, and so forth. Um, but uh, I think from a, a Christian perspective, we can bring a framework to this which gives us as hope uh, and enables us to hopefully take a, an optimistic approach to it in the sense that uh, I, I think we have very good reasons for looking at this technology, not as something that threatens our humanity, but as something that is a, a tool. Um, and the danger, of course, is when we view it as something other than, than a tool or a technology that can be hopefully used in a, a beneficial way. So if we view it in, in, in that way, I, I think there are a lot of, a lot of potential benefits. Um, and just to highlight one, I would say, in, in the whole area of medical, the medical domain. Um, 
we've talked a little bit about AI and machine learning. Um, and so some of this is more at the level of the machine learning, using these techniques to understand these vast amounts of data that we have in terms of, of medicine and, and trying to uh, address a lot of problems with, with various conditions. I think there's enormous scope uh, for this. Again, there are concerns about how AI might be used within the medical domain, and we, we need to think about those carefully, but I, I think there are huge opportunities for, for great good in that domain. Well, my perspective is, as someone who, who's actually started off in AI in computer speech and language understanding, which I found absolutely and utterly fascinating, I think mostly because for me it was a multidisciplinary um, activity. We were combining both, you know, neural networks and symbolic AI to deal with uh, dialogue processing and semantic processing. So I was absolutely fascinated as a scientist and as a technologist. Um, but you'll probably be rather surprised to know that I won't have Alexa in our home. And I think in a way, what that's illustrating is, for me, as a technologist who, who really is fascinated, uh, as I'm sure David is, you know, practicing and working in that area, fascinated by the technology, but really quite disillusioned with the way in which it's been sort of taken over uh, and exploited, uh, and has, in, in the case of speech recognition, what could we do with it? it would be really fantastic. I have a 97-year-old mother. Uh, she's not very mobile. Unfortunately, she didn't sort of track the technology trend. Um, it would be perfect for her to have something like Alexa and to use that to um, provide, uh, you know, switch the TV on, switch the heater on, do all sorts of things. That's what we were aiming at, you know, in the 80s, 90s of my first company that sort of idea. But, you know, those sorts of applications are rather specialist. Um, and the idea now that uh, probably most of you know that Alexa records the data even when you, you don't think it is, and there are people all over the world who are transcribing uh, that data with a view to try and improve the technology. Now, that in and of itself, as a technologist, I understand what they're doing. All of the time that you speak into Alexa, it's using that data to improve the algorithms more. There's no data like more data. But there are circumstances in which, um, you, you know, they don't want this to be terribly publicly known, but there are circumstances in which transcribers have overheard, uh, obviously after the event, uh, quite serious issues going on in a home environment, domestic violence, that sort of thing. And they've been told, well, actually, that's nothing to do with us. We cannot intervene. And in one sense, uh, they probably shouldn't because they're eavesdropping. Um, for me, that's raising incredibly complex ethical issues. And you might call me a Luddite, I don't know. But I'm just sort of feeling it's really putting me off the use of the technology because of, of Bruce's point, what it's doing to us. Um, you hear of children shouting at Alexa and becoming really rude um, to, to Alexa. Uh, and so the, the strategy there is to see whether they can you know, improve the way Alexa speaks back. What, I mean, the, 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 yeah, this is all sound, you know, we... we, we Deutsch, kind of panic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, on one level, this is all very funny and amusing, but on another level, as Bruce has pointed out, what is this doing to us? Well, I don't think we, as humanity, have even begun to think about how we handle interactions with what is an artifact. And these artifacts are shaping us. Um, is that good? And my reflections so far are that um, I, I'm not so sure. So. I find it hard to have the optimism. I, I know what, what uh, David means by, you know, we can be optimistic as Christians for the future, but of course we live in a fallen world. And my pessimism relates to the fact that we live in a fallen world and also the fact that although there are several thousand AI companies, startup AI companies, the real action is in Google, Alibaba, Tencent, 
uh, the big companies who have most of the talent, most of the funding. And, you know, two contemporaries of mine got bought by Apple. And, and you know, just like that. Why? For their technology? I don't think so, really, to take them off of the marketplace and to, to buy the talent. So these sorts of dynamics cause me real cause for concern. I'm still absolutely fascinated by the technology as a technologist. I've taught long enough, so. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, I am, as a lawyer, quite pessimistic about the world. And we like to see lots of risk and try to help organizations and people abate those risks. So I, I agree with Bruce Little that, you know, I, I'm concerned about the what is it doing to us. But I also agree with David in the sense of these are tools, they, these are artifacts, this is software at the end of the day and um, that has so much potential for people and benefits for society, for those who are vulnerable, those who are disabled and those are disadvantaged, disadvantaged in the world. I think we could also use it as a tool for evangelizing the gospel. So there's so much benefit there for us. Um, but equally, I have many concerns about the, the privacy impact and the human right impact for us as well. Um, so what I'm really looking forward to, and this is why it requires a multidisciplinary forum here, is holding AI accountable. And that that's you know responsible and accountable. We as a humanity, we like to defer responsibility and fault. Um, it started in the Garden of Eden. Um, Adam deferred fault. It wasn't me. It was a woman you gave me. And so <laughs> um, I think there is a real danger of that happening in our current time. Certainly with trying to ascribe personhood to robotics. Um, so I'm really looking forward to a time when we can genuinely hold AI accountable. As I mentioned on my presentation, the main uh, worries, the, the main thing which we, we, we need to be aware that AI itself maybe could not be worried for us, could not be harmful, but the human implementation of AI mechanism could be could be harmful, could be uh, done in, in the bad way and uh, could not help people but could even uh, stop people working, could, uh, could not be useful in that sense. So we rather uh, should be uh, worried about the implementation, about that what humans as a moral beings are doing with the, those machines, with those mechanisms, with those algorithms. Uh, and according to this, it will work uh, for us or against us, right? Uh, as uh, on this poster uh, in the US regarding the guns regulation, not only guns kill people, but people kill people. In that sense, again, not AI will be harmful for us, but human implementation will be harmful. So, sorry for not being so optimistic. Okay, it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think if Alexander had asked a question about what our overall opinion was about AI, I mean, there there are certainly concerns and, and quite legitimate concerns, as others have, have mentioned here. Um, but, but the question was about what there is to look forward to. And I think there's, there's loads of, of potential scope for these technologies that is e extremely beneficial. Uh, and, and so the, the key challenge is for, for us to be part of that discussion and trying to shape how the technology is been, being used. And I think from a Christian perspective, we have uh, this wonderful worldview that we can bring to bear on these issues to think about some of these fundamental questions about what it means to be human in the age of AI. Uh, a question which I, I think is, it's, it's very difficult to, to really give a, a, a good answer from a, a purely secular viewpoint, I think, because ultimately we are just physical machines, I think, if you take a naturalistic view of the world. So I think a Christian framework has very, something very positive um, to offer us. So we can then look at, at, at these debates um, and where we go with the technology and now try to set it in that context that, that humans are unique, so there is not a threat there, but there are also all of these issues about how the technology could be used in, in negative and harmful ways. Um, and so we need to think ab about a, a biblical view as to what it means to be made in the image of God and, and how the technology can be used within that framework in a positive way, along the lines that Jeremy was setting out in his talk yesterday. Can I just come back yeah. very briefly? I, I'm going to try and put a more positive, <laughs> optimistic spin. I, I agree with David and 
and what Trish was saying, I think that uh, I'm actually quite excited about the opportunities, even uh, pre-evangelism opportunities, to, to do exactly what you're saying. Uh, we've got a story as, as Christians uh, about what it means to be created in the image of God. You, you've heard all of that. And, and I'm excited about that opportunity to engage people in conversation, uh, even maybe through the, the technologists themselves and some of the leaders of these companies. Um, I'm optimistic about how AI can be used if it is used responsibly. I'd be working just a little bit with a, a company that, that's looking at using AI uh, as, as part of a, an implant to help with problems like epilepsy, for example. There's all sorts of very positive things that, you know, you cannot think of easy ways of solving some of those other ways of solving those problems. But it all comes down to us being in control, the masters and slaves of, of my title. I'm optimistic if we can convince people and convince actually senior people in industry that we must be in control. The, the fear side comes in that I know how business works mm -hmm. and I know that generally speaking, uh, most people don't really care as long as they're making money. I'm sorry, that's a bit crude. So we, we can be optimistic about many areas in which artificial intelligence could be used very helpfully, but we must control how it's used and we must have a voice and maybe that's something that we as a Christian community just need to rise up to the challenge to have a, a, a voice heard and I think we have a potential for that because we're not just pushing the gospel down people's throats but we're coming with a Christian worldview that people can resonate with what we have to say about what it means to be human and, and that we have freedom and freedom of choice and, and conscience. So um, I'm involved with a couple of things actually. The um, Global Standards Organization, the IEEE, um, that is looking at um, algorithmic um, accountability. I'm also involved with a, another group called Women Leading in AI that is an action tank looking at um, the impact um, on society. Uh, there are a number of other bodies in the UK that are looking at the impact on society. Um, I think, um, going to some of our previous point, um, this is a real opportunity now for us to shape the technology so that we are sh shaping the society that we want to create. I think that the statement of um, a preferred societal norm, we, the tech reflects what is the societal norm for today, and people are looking into the future to see what a preferred societal norm would look like in the future. The, the challenge is, yes, there are a lot of people going in the same direction, looking for, for example, fairness, looking for responsible tech, looking for accountable tech, um, looking for it to be explainable, looking for it to be transparent. All of these messages are right, um, even the kind of concept of in making them transparent, requiring trust marks so that we can trust the technology that we're dealing with and that it's clear to us that an automated decision has been made about us. But I think underlying all that, we have to understand that maybe our world views are different in the ultimate outcome. So um, going to some of the other speakers and certainly what Jeremy spoke about yesterday, you know, we, we've got to be mindful in the midst of all of this that of um, authority, are we passing authority to machines and autonomy, are we giving over autonomy to the machines and then also moral agency as well. And so I think some of the rest of the world views might have a different angle on those than ours. And so I think it's important that we, we speak up now and influence. And I think there's two ways we can um, influence that societal um, norm of the future and for the greater good of society. And I say for the greater good of society for all, rather than for the greater good of society at large. That is, there's a very subtle difference, um, but I think there's a real concern that we could help this tech um, go for the betterment of society um, for the majority. But if you happen to be our minority, um, if you're aged and you're not included in the digital landscape, or if you are a Christian and choose not to engage with the, the data or the AI itself, or if, if, you, if you're just a Luddite, you know, um, there's a real danger that your voice won't be heard, your perspective on the world won't be heard, your, your preferred social norm won't be heard, and therefore, if you're not engaging it, it won't be representative, because it won't be represented in the data. The data will then be um, 
inadvertently biased against you, that's fed into the algorithms, and the algorithms will have an impact that if you put biased data in, you get biased data out. So this is the time for us to really influence. It may even be too late, going to what Jeremy said, but I think there's two ways we could potentially influence this societal norm as, as uh, Christians. Uh, one is, um, I think, where we can to get involved in the governance of these algorithms and um, AI and machine learning for the future in organizations, in industry, in our workplaces. And I might come back to that later with ethical advisory boards and panels and councils and all of that. Um, but then also shaping the regulation, the policy, the law, um, the standards that really fit around all this stuff. And we have a number of scientists in the room, you're, you're expert in your field. If you have an industry body you work with, then really call out to them and, and try and, and raise up the standards in this area. I hope that helps. Can I come back on that one? Um, let, let me use an illustration to um, pose the dilemma, I think, in what sort of uh, society do we want, what sort of civilization do we want. China has now, I think, more smart cities, as I mentioned in my talk, than the rest of the world put together. Now, is that a good thing or is it a bad thing for society? Well, uh, some of the statistics from one of the cities, um, traffic moves faster, you get to work on time, uh, ambulances are getting to the hospital, I forget the number, something like 11 minutes quicker than they did previously. And so if you look at the statistics of the use of quite significant amount of AI and sensor information around the, the smart city, you could argue that that's actually benefiting society. The problem I have with it is back to the same question, who is in control? Now, the contrast, I chose China really because I think it, it's a contrast between a state-controlled uh, society and uh, democracy, which we hope we have still in the West. Um, China, you don't really get much choice. They have decided they will go forward with smart cities. The Chinese people seem to be um, much more amenable for the convenience aspect to put up with the lack of data privacy and the fact that, that you know, the government knows where they are at any point in time. Now, when we come to a democratic society, where does the control lie? And typically, I think in Western economies, the control often lies, unfortunately, with, with big companies. Um, you might not realize that, but actually you are very much controlled by um, global large companies, not necessarily just by your government. But I think we do have an opportunity here. Maybe this is the optimism um, that we can think about in some societies to engage the public. Because if we engage the public with the debate about what sort of civilization, what sort of society do you want? Yes, we could do lots of smart things in cities. We could have self-drive cars. When I've mentioned self-drive cars to even other Christians, they, they look at me aghast. You know, well, why wouldn't we have a self-drive car? We could save seven million deaths in Europe or whatever. And actually, ultimately, the question comes down to, is that the sort of society that we want? Because in doing that, we're actually giving up moral agency to that vehicle. And I think it, we live in a fallen world. And I think as a consequence of living in the fallen world, we do have to make choices and we can help people think about this as Christians because we're really well informed, I, I feel. If we're made in the image of God, we're made as those that have conscience and free will, freedom to choose, and ultimately we're accountable to God, accountable to each other. Do we want to cede, to give up that accountability to an artifact just purely on the basis that, well, it might be safer. Because ultimately, what does that desire come down to? Isn't it, uh, you know, for Nivirva, Nivirva, you know, for a, a safer uh, society, something that, where we can have, um, you know, immortality? I'm thinking of a, a non-Christian view of this, that always wanting to go for a more protected, safer society. But if we can help people to understand that there are some consequences 
of building a safer society in this way of smart cities, self-drive vehicles, and so on. And those consequences are a loss of choice, a loss of freedom, and uh, as I was saying in my talk, the loss of moral acuity in terms of our ability to think and to, and to make decisions. This is a debate, I'm, I'm probably coming across quite strongly here, but I, I'm doing so because I think we need to think about these issues and, and then begin to think, should we now be raising this debate in wider society as Christians who have an answer, who have optimism, um, because we know ultimately our God is in control, and that, that, that's what makes me um, absolutely optimistic, because whatever man does, God is in control. So it's getting this discussion going, and I think it ultimately comes down to asking people, who's in control, government, society, or big corporate? Uh, and that's, that's the thing that we need. And then do you want, what's the shape of the society that you actually want? The Chinese may be actually happy to give up a lot of these things we've talked about for the sake of convenience. Do we? Uh, and I, th I hope that sort of addresses your, your question about the wider issue. I'm probably um, one who wants to throw the pigeon or the cat among the pigeons. Um, but it seems that there is, uh, is a, and I would agree with what's being said here, that I'm not in disagreement. What I am concerned about is the focus. It's about what does it do for us. Um, so it's a, another sentence for me in the sad story of what has started with the Enlightenment, and that is that we progress is what we are aiming for. And when you have to have a notion of what is progress, then you have to have criteria to determine what progress is. And there are two basic criteria that's been working in the Western world, and that is efficiency and convenience. And once we have accepted that as the standard by which we measure, um, it, it was Neil Postman who said back in 1993 in his book Technopoly, and he said that tech, new technologies alter the structure of our interest. It also influences the structure or the, the words that we began to use to talk about humanity. And so we're thinking, oh, this will give us a bigger, a faster, a better, a stronger. Those are all functionalistic concepts. They don't talk about things that, in a Christian view, that is the matter of virtues. Where, where are virtues in this discussion? When I think about what kind of a society do I want, well, do I want a, a fa you know, the smart city, or do I want a virtuous city? <laughs> now, that may sound very silly to you, but it seems to me from the Christian point of view, we are, have been somewhat guilty in picking up the language, the words, that come out of a very naturalistic worldview that are hinged on this notion of progress, and we don't realize sometimes that the words we use are quite subversive to the very desire that we have, namely uh, people who live courageous lives, virtuous lives, rather than people who are living, oh, I can do this faster now. Please understand, I am not against those sort of things if we clearly understand what's going on here. Now, I'm getting excited like Jeremy, okay? <laughs> but in tracking this sort of thing now for some 20, excuse me, some uh, eight to 10 years, this is what I see is we're missing as Christians. We do not realize how much we have been shaped in our language by the very technology that we're now questioning. And so, we, we say, well, there's a question here, but we're doing it all with a language that actually supports that technology. And that's uh, somewhat uh, concerning to me. Uh, it, it's a lack of being uh, prudent uh, in, in thinking about, is this what we want? You know, yes, who's in control? But the question is, what kind of a society do we want as Christians? And one of the things I noticed is that as I listen to Christians speak today, um, and they talk about values, 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 
And I said, where did that come from? The, the Christian community used to talk about virtues. But now we talk about values. Why can we talk about values? Because we've been influenced by naturalistic thinking and the idea of progress. We say, I'm for family values. And I said, what does that mean? It only means anything once you've defined for me what you mean by family. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm, yes, I, I've, I've spoken more than I should here. But it, it, it's a, a matter that I think, oh, you think, oh, now you've got the philosopher mucking around in this, and he's talking about things that let's just get on with life, and let's see how much good we can get out of this, <laughs> and how can we stop the, ne the, the, the negative. And I'm all for that. I, I'm a, I haven't heard anything here that I disagree with. But I'm looking at the lower level, the philosophical side of things, and we need to be sensitive to what kind of language we're using uh, when we're talking about this subject, if we really want to change the direction that it's going in. I would agree with Bruce wholeheartedly um, in terms of the efficiencies and uh, its fundamental core is speed and convenience, which I'm sure we're all guilty of in this room. Um, but I think there's another issue, and perhaps a philosophical one, of personalization. So the first leg you mentioned was time but I think there's a real subconscious message going on with people of I want to be known better please know me better so they they sell their preferences and give over their likes and dislikes so that they're known better and through personalization that's where they get the greater data and so on and so forth so anyway yeah I mean I, I was just going to make uh, one comment I think it relates back to the the question that was asked and also to what Bruce has been saying and I, I think there. It's clear, I think, from our, our discussion that we shouldn't be thinking about the role of AI technology just as a, a very specific focus about what do we do with this technology. It is much, it is part of a much wider conversation about what sort of society where we we want, um, what sort of society um, do, do we as a, a culture actually want, and there are different visions as to what that looks like. Um, and, and I think here again, there, there is an, an opportunity for, for Christians to contribute to this. And it's not just Christians who have some expertise in the technology or something like that. We, we need help from people, from Christians, from all sorts of disciplines in this to think about what, what does a good society look like? Um, and so when we think about AI technology and, and where it fits in, I think one of the opportunities here is that it is raising very big questions about what sort of society we, we want to look at. I mean, in other contexts, um, we, we might think about this question and we might look at one vision of society and we look at a Christian vision and we think, well, society is going off in the wrong direction here, but nobody's listening to a Christian voice on this. One of the things that I think is fascinating is that AI is raising this question about what sort of society we want. And here's an opportunity for Christians to work together from our different disciplines, our different perspectives, and to, to try to spell out and a way that is is helpful within a wider society as to what a, a Christian vision of a good society is like. So just a small comment regarding uh, all those uh, commentaries from, from your side. Uh, regarding Patricia's talk uh, that um, today's people uh, will it to, to be more known, more personalized, uh, uh, and uh, also, in this area, AI is, is, is coming for us uh, because AI and rather machine learning than AI is, is uh, wanted to personalize advertisement for us, personalize uh, our views of workspace for us, it's personalizing uh, our digital environment for us. So it is personalizing in that sense uh, meaning that um, better known us but that's not true of course because uh, as you said uh, that's the, the human need and i suppose that's the uh, very similar discussion with, with bruce mentioned the distinction between values and virtues right the virtue will be on a deeper level uh, and uh, we also need the, the the virtue not value of of knowing us by us, I mean, that uh, I, I really enjoy that uh, people around me knows me, 
and not the artificial knows me because that's not the value for me at all. It is convenient, for sure. Uh, I really like that uh, elements on my desktop are in the place where I will uh, I will look at it, right? Um, where, where I will search for it. Uh, and I don't need to uh, really do the hard work to to use the device. It is personalized for me. I really enjoy it. But still there is a question, fundamental question uh, regarding the privacy, regarding the uh, who's in, in control. Is it this machine, this artificial, this machine learning uh, is working for me, is doing things uh, for me, or uh, is it... Uh, in charge and I need to fit in. That's the question. But uh, the optimistic accent in the end is that uh, what Jeremy said, that uh, as a Christian, I know that whatever people decide to do and whatever artificial do, uh, God's in charge, definitely. And we are, and any artificial are not able to change it. Can I, as a pigeon, pick up the cat? Uh, was it, is, is it that way around? <laughs> if I may. Um, really, I, I think it would be good to try and, and, and just deepen the discussion a little bit about the terminology, the language that we're using. Can I come back to the, the Chinese example again? And, and, and I'd like to see how we react to the terminology and, and how we start to talk about virtues, if you like, for, for society. From a Chinese perspective, the, you're probably all aware of the sort of social credit score idea. Uh, and in one sense, uh, challenge back to Bruce really, could you not argue or could they not argue that what they're actually trying to do is to produce a more virtuous society? That is that people attend school and, and they don't steal and you know that they are better citizens and so i'm wondering how do we address that sort of level of state control through the use of ai it doesn't really matter in one sense what they're using but their objective seems to be to control their society to make them more virtuous um, and if that's the case how do we engage in this debate with using uh, the terminology of virtues and moving away from the, I agree with you, you know, the efficiency and convenience side of it. So it's a counter question, if I may. May I just yeah. add? But I would argue, no, I would submit, because I can't, I don't have time to make an argument. So I'm just going to state <laughs> <laughs> that's not making the person virtuous. What that may be doing is assimilating a virtue, but then we'd make the mistake that similarity is sameness, and it's not. And so I would say, Jeremy, in response to that, yes, it has those kind of elements where you say, well, but we're not making, we're not making people more virtuous when we're taking from them the moral agency. Yeah. And virtue, virtue is what is moral agency is about, is it not? So I don't know. Uh, um, you, I don't know if you've taken the cat out of the pigeons, or I just threw it back in again. <laughs> but that, it's helpful because I, I think what you're doing is throwing us back, maybe, to focus on. Would it be right to say focus on the moral agency issue, the freedom, freedom of of, of choice, and that if that's right, we're we're beginning to sort of develop a common language that actually is a, a genuinely Christian. Uh, perspective, but one which will still, I feel, resonate hugely with a non-Christian society if we if we present that right, and that is tremendously exciting, I think. Um, so, just a small comment from from my side. Uh, of course, uh, as uh, similar as a dishwasher, right? Dishwasher also uh, sa saves a lot of time for washing the dishes, right? You need to do this using your hands. You can just simply use the dishwasher and you got a lot of time and you can do whatever you want. Uh, and again, but still, uh, I just uh, wonder if the people uh, who have those extra time will spend this extra time uh, on the relation, on the relation with God, relation with other people. I observe currently that most of young people um, 
I assume that all of us are young in that sense. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, most of young people uh, during, uh, let's say, during the meal, right? They are using their smart smartphones to be in touch with technology, uh, even if uh, close to them uh, are real humans to which they could speak and have a relation, even uh, maybe not so deep, but still the real relation, but not, not artificial relation with their smartphone. Bruce, you to say yeah, please. Yes, I would say, <laughs> because I'm speaking, it would be I would say, of course. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure why we make these stupid <laughs> statements. Uh, one thing is, uh, yes, um, I, I'm not against efficiency or convenience. What I am saying is it should not be the sole criteria by which we measure what prog uh, progress means. I think, to your point, uh, we already see that technology is not making us more relational. Uh, it is just the opposite. All the studies, most of the studies, the majority of the studies come out, uh, are telling us that, for example, social media, uh, mediated reality, all of these things are making us far more isolated, uh, even uh, uh, there's a depressed. Uh, we don't know how to communicate with one another. Shirley Tur Sherry Turkle, who has written her book, you know, Reclaiming Conversation, we got young people growing up who don't even know how to speak to one another. Uh, they can only talk through a cell phone, I mean, through a text or whatever. Uh, I have to be careful because I'm not very uh, technologically uh, inclined here. Uh, but the other thing is, and I want to raise this for all of us, as in that if, if we go back to the, the idea that we saw very clearly during the Reformation, the idea that work was a way that we glorified God and that we were to do everything as unto the Lord, well, where is, that, where is that notion, what is happening to that notion that, okay, uh, because I don't wash the dishes, <laughs> uh, I, I would think, yeah, well, a dishwash is a pretty good idea. But I want to look at it in a broader sense. If we, if we hand over these possible tasks, I'm not saying that they couldn't do them faster, better, do the calculations and everything. And that's all well and good, but then I'm going to come back and ask, as a Christian, and I'm made in the image of God, one who is to be a creator and to do my work, my labor, uh, that, that work itself has an intrinsic value to it. And if we're giving these up, then are we giving up a possibility of reflecting our uniqueness made in the image of God, that, we, that we, we reflect that image in the way we do our work, but now we're, we're getting away from work uh, and we're just getting away to uh, free time. And Kierkegaard said that's a dangerous thing, uh, too much free time. So I hear a lot of discussion on relations, but what about this notion as a Christian of work? Um, so I'm, I'm not uh, pontificating, though it sounds like it. Uh, <laughs> I'm only suggesting, well, is this something we also need to put into the equation when we're talking about this? Uh, I, I'm not against, uh, I'm not a Luddite, <laughs> Jeremy. I'm, I'm really not a Luddite. Uh, I may sound like one, but they would be making the mistake of similarity and sameness. I have some of the same thoughts and some of the same concerns, but they go much deeper than that. So I would just be interested, what do people think about this, I, this whole idea of uh, whatsoever you do, do it to the glory of God. Uh, where does the craftsmanship come? A uh, 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 small task, important task as a Christian. You know, that I sweep the floor but I sweep, the, I sweep the floor in a way that reflects God. Um, that I build a chair in a way, now I'm being very simplistic, I'm gonna stop. Uh, but Jeremy wants to put the cat and pigeons in. <laughs> I completely agree actually with, with, with your analysis there about the 
you know, the problem of, of, okay, you have free time, but we actually don't use it for relationship. To just build on what uh, Bruce is saying about work, um, there's a lot of discussion going on about uh, job losses, both white collar and blue collar workers. And I think fundamentally, from, again, from a Christian perspective, we have to get back to the notion of the dignity of work. God has created us to work, to subdue, to, to rule, to be vice regents in, in the, the, his creation. So there's something right about us working and laboring. And I think that AI, um, if you follow the predictions, has the potential, uh, as I pointed out yesterday, to maybe impact 400 to 800 million jobs by 2030. We don't know whether that will happen or not. People have got all sorts of different opinions about that. But what is uh, definitely agreed is that there will be a need to people f to reskill, to find other jobs. People are talking about the whole notion of bringing in a baseline income. Um, but what are people going to do with the rest of the time? For me, that takes away the whole notion that uh, we're created to work uh, and there's a dignity in work. Um, I'm just frightened by the idea of uh, people turning to Netflix, they'll turn to virtual reality. And virtual reality um, is just so immersive. It is just addictive. It's just unbelievable. You ain't seen nothing yet, <laughs> you know, if I can put it in those, those terms. So we're definitely, I feel, societally-wise, what sort of society we, do we want, going completely and utterly in the wrong direction. And here again, the optimism... As believers, we've got, a, we've got a fantastic message of hope to bring civilization back. How on earth we will achieve that with, with the, the, the power of government now pushing in a direction that I think is not the direction we want to go and companies pushing in that direction. But at least if we can agree the terminology, um, we can agree the message and then um, start to articulate that message. I, I think it's... It's, it's great hope. I just wanted to add to that, the, the, the time and efficiency thing, not only having an impact on work, but I think there's a, a, a subtle, submersive thing go, um, going on there, um, which is the erosion of free will and the erosion of choice. And so these things are being put in place to enable us to use our time more efficiently uh, for speed and for convenience. But actually what's happening is in, in the midst of that, that we're, we are thinking that we're making a choice. We think that we're choosing to kind of delegate our human authority, subjugate our human autonomy. Um, but in doing so, we're eroding our human privacy. We're relinquishing and surrendering our human ability to make the free will choices and thus also moral agency. But I just want to kind of give some examples of that just to put bare bones on kind of where we're eroding our choice. And uh, I think... Um, why I say about choice, because actually it comes back to the, the, subver um, the submersive and the addictive nature of some of the things we're engaging with. And that's the problem. It's all started with nudge economics um, that has tried to prompt you and remind you of things. But what then that comes is, I, I don't know about anyone else, but you, you go on a Facebook rabbit hole or a Netflix rabbit hole or a Twitter rabbit hole. You start with one message and it sends you to another and another. And you, by, by the time you, you sort of wake up to yourself, in, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour has passed. And that's in its purest form addiction. And actually, you could argue it's possibly taking you wor away from work. Um, but just examples of the erosion of choice that I was pondering last night um, was, um, you know, I now don't have to search for the cheapest credit card or car or home insurance or holiday or flight or loan. I can assign a concierge, an autobot, to search my, for bank or utility accounts so I can get the most favorable rates. My bank account data can now all be seen and categorized all in one place so I don't even have to log on to three or four different bank saving account apps. Um, I won't have to drive so I can work, sleep, eat, etc. whilst traveling. I won't have to have to uh, ring or visit anyone anymore. I can monitor my elderly parent in their home using Alexa or other tools, smart homes, or, or, or even my friend's activity because I see it on Facebook or follow them on geolocator data. I don't have to get, on, get up even from my seat to turn my lights on or off or to set my heating or oven or close my curtains. 
I don't have to do my shopping. The fridge will do it for me and purchase it online and have it delivered. I won't have to care for my elderly parent because I can employ a robot to do it. All of this is, we're seeing it as choice. We have a choice to purchase and engage with these things, but actually fundamentally it's eroding things, free will at the core. So I, I think one of the, the, the dangers with technology is, is simply that we, we put too much weight on it. And that can result in us either thinking, oh, well, the technology is very negative and it's, it's going to lead to disaster and we should avoid it. But perhaps a bigger concern in society is that we think the technology is going to solve all our problems and that it will address so many issues and just make life wonderful. And I think this is something that we, we do need to call into question for precisely the sorts of reasons that you've been talking about. And it does bother me when I, I look at some of the, the books that are written, the popular books like Harari's book, on, on, on this, where he, he sets out this, this vision as to where we're going with technology. And, and what he's, he's spelling out is, is this idea that, that as a result of this technology, that, that we're going to become, uh, essentially, we're going to become better, better people. We're, you know, our lives are going to be much better. We're going to be much happier. So happy, happiness is, is one part of this. We're going to have these new abilities, almost godlike abilities that we're, we're going to have. And in terms of, of upgrading our bodies and so on, we're, we're, we're going to have something like immortality. Now, I know this is science fiction, but this is a sort of vision that some people are presenting. And, 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 what this is is, is is almost like a, a secular version of, of a, a religious identity. It's, it's like taking some themes from a, a religious identity and, and getting rid of God, getting rid of the whole Christian worldview and trying to uh, adopt some of the same sorts of ideas of immortality and so forth. So I, I think there's a real danger. I mean, and that's an extreme version of it, of thinking that the technology is just going to, to solve all our problems. We need to come back to this idea idea of the, the technology as, as being a tool, an artifact that we can think about how it's used and hopefully as a society try to think about how we can use it wisely and as Christians um, shape that. Um, and, and I think the point about, about work is, is a good one. Um, there, I, I think there are parallels with um, uh, with industrialization uh, as well. Um, I, I think that's right. And, and so uh, there are legitimate questions that we, we can ask here um, uh, about job losses. Um, but we, again, shouldn't think of the technology as providing the, the solution that it will solve all these problems and we can just have all of this free time because that just, I, I think, it, it leads to all sorts of problems, especially as, as we've been talking about from a Christian worldview and the, the value of work. But neither should we think of it as, uh, well, we should stop the technology because work is so valuable that we should never be concerned with efficiency or, or so forth. And I know nobody's saying that. But then how do we approach it? How do we approach these questions? Well, I, I think we need to, again, view it not as a technology being the solution or the problem, but how we can use the technology in a beneficial way. What is the technology for? Um, if we're developing these tools, what's the purpose in developing them? What are we trying to achieve? And I think this is something we, we need to think about. I think, again, the answer to that for many corporations is to make lots of money. Um, so people will develop stuff. Why? Because we can. So if you can develop a robot, which I was watching a video of one the other day, stacking shelves endlessly, um, why would we do that? Well, because we can do it, and it can do it 24-7. And a human can't do that. Um, can you imagine a guy whose basic skill is, you know, fairly limited, physically, very fit, able to do that job, and he's been doing that job, you know, maybe for 20 years and reasonably content doing that job? How does he feel when he sees a video of a robot that is just going to replace him? How do you think you would feel if something artifact replaced your job, I think we'd actually feel, you know, pretty, um, pretty, pretty awful about it, wouldn't we? Yeah, we'd feel demeaned. We'd feel that, <clears throat> you know, um, useless. Um, coming back to the question, <coughs> excuse me, about the industrial revolution, 
Um, a lot of people are arguing there are parallels with the Industrial Revolution. Some studies, interestingly, have been done uh, that show, although GDP has often increased in certain uh, sectors, in industrial sectors, as a result of automation, um, some areas it's actually decreased. Agriculture is an extremely uh, prominent uh, sort of indicator of that. And um, people have just gone out of, of work in, in agriculture across the globe. But I think whether you look at the Industrial Revolution and how jobs were replaced and use that as a model or not, I do think there is a very significant difference between the mechanization that took place through the Industrial Revolution and uh, AI, which is, apart from robotics, software. Uh, and that means that you can replicate this um, almost you know, instantly, you can distribute it around the globe instantly. If you want to create a loom machine or whatever in the Industrial Revolution, it, it was costly, it took time. And the same will be true for, for robots, intelligent robots. They will take time. They're going to be lag behind uh, computer-based, if I can use that uh, terminology, software-based artificial intelligence, simply because they're more complex, they're much more expensive. It will take time to introduce them uh, into you know, Amazon's warehouse or, or whatever for stacking the shelves. But I think that because AI is now not really replacing manual labor, blue-collar blue jobs, it's actually coming into highly skilled areas, um, it's, it is raising questions about what will those highly skilled jobs do. Um, there's no simple answers to that. But I think it's, it's inevitable. Already we can see that there's an impact on people's uh, jobs uh, and, and on their, their, their work style, if you like. So I, I do think, unfortunately, there are some significant differences to the Industrial Revolution, and there will be people left out of work and will be wondering, well, what do we do? That's why there is all this discussion about providing people a, a minimum income to overcome that problem. So in other words, you, you understand what I mean by you're aware of that concept of a minimum income government will pay you to do nothing, essentially. I stepped out of paid employment <laughs> with a global body to set up my own organization called Beyond Reach so that I could, re uh, my, my core of it is to engage with upcoming leaders of churches, engage with churches, so that we can rise up and have a Christian response to this. Um, I want to raise awareness of the power of data that is in our hands, what we do with that. I want to raise awareness about algorithms, and I think that's what we're doing in AI and what we're doing here. But then ultimately want to come to a biblical view of a biblical response of what does the Bible teach us about all of this? And But what I, in my heart, want to do is engage with, and I'm going to not be ageist here, um, but millennials predominantly, because this is the world that's going to affect my children and my children's children, and, and, and obviously people younger than me. And, uh, um, but to really collaboratively come up with a response. You know, if we engage with this stuff, what are the pros and cons? If we don't engage with this stuff, what are the pros and cons? Because whether we engage with it, or whether we don't, there are consequences to both sets of actions. Whether we choose to buy an autonomous vehicle or we don't choose to buy an autonomous vehicle, there will be consequences and impact on us whether we like it or not. And I'll just take data as an example because data is what my life has been about for so far too long of my life. Um, is that <coughs> even if I don't choose to share my data with a social media company or with an organization, some of my friends or some of my family or people I'm connected with, even business connections, so like say on LinkedIn, for example, they would share data and they might reference me and I might not know about that. And so these tools will make not only hold elements of personal information or data about me, but they will ultimately, through the AI, make inferences and insight and derive data that could potentially have an impact on machines that make decisions about my, and artifacts that make decisions about my life and the life of my family. And the predominant area that will work is in public sector services that are providing to me and also in terms of healthcare and provision to me. So I just think that's something we need to as a church. I think you're very right. The practical outcome of this is we need to have tools in our hand and we need a toolkit. And I'd like to work with churches, the church, the kingdom to do that. The area that you're working in 
um, absolutely, somebody needs to be working in that area because it's it's quite a, a, a significant issue, cyber security. Uh, and you could argue, one level of argument might be, this is going to happen whether we, as Christians, like it or not. So uh, the, the better, the safer we can make the, these, uh, these vehicles, um, the better. That's, that's one way of approaching it. Um, the other would be there are lots of areas in AI that are less emotive and less challenging in terms of the moral issues. So <laughs> I'm being very direct here. You could consider working uh, in some other area. I mean, <laughs> you didn't want to hear that. You asked for a very practical... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but what I do know is that there's a huge scarcity of, of, of people uh, working in, in, in the AI area. Many companies just can't get enough people. So uh, you're a valuable asset, I'm quite sure. I, I think it's great you're working in, in this sort of area. Uh, it's great that we have Christians who are, who are working in, in areas like this. Um, so so keep up the good work. Um, but I, I think what, what it does raise, though, is, is a question. And, and this is the sort of question it should raise for, for all of us in, in different areas of work. And, and even if you're perhaps um, from a, a different area working in science um, and you're not working in AI, still, whatever area you are working in, it will raise questions about how that relates to your Christian worldview. Now, one of the approaches that we can take is the, the approach that a lot of people um, who are not Christians take. And this is, well, I will just get on with the technical details of my work and my career. And of course, as Christians, we could do the same thing. But I I think this would be a huge mistake. One of the things that we need to do as Christians is to think about these issues. And if we can find other Christians who are also thinking about them in their discipline, or perhaps others who are in our field as well, and we can explore these issues, and we can ask questions about what we're doing and whether what are the ethics of this area. So rather than just trying to give an answer as to my opinion um, about uh, uh, automated cars or, or whatever, well, discuss this amongst uh, Christians who are thinking about these things. And I think the more we can do to facilitate those, those discussions is, is great.